All right, Sherry. The courtship is over. Mm-hmm. Oh, the adoration. Oh, the je vous adore. You are my peanut. I am your brittle. Mm-hmm. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, baby. And are you struggling with a relationship? Well, let's help you find love, sugar. Today, the Drew Barrymore Show love expert, Damona Hoffman, will tell you how. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Joe, I can't keep that up. Here we go. For our TikTok Minute, we'll show you a great way to avoid Valentine's fights. In our headline segment, how do you make a great first impression at work? Well, with Love in the Air, we asked reality TV dating coach Rachel Greenwald how learning to make a great dating impression might also help you score better work opportunities. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Chad, who wants to know how much he can contribute to his Roth IRA for 2023. And then, I'll share some lovely trivia. And now... Two guys who love to see you stacking Benjamins. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Happy pre-Valentine's Day to you, stackers. I am Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. It is the day that love is in the air, and I love the fact that I get to sit right across from this gentleman, Mr. OG. How are you, buddy? Valentine's Day Eve, you've got the stockings hung, filled with candles, <laughs> chocolates, hoping that the Valentine's Cupid bunny shows up. Oh, Cupid shows up, comes down I the. Think Mrs. OG has a roll of quarters in her stockings waiting for you. <laughs> what? Just smash me on the head or something? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, defend herself. I think. Oh, <laughs> ward me off. Yes. I thought it was quarters for the bed. I'm a hunk of hunk of burning love. What's what's? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Can't oh, control this. Well, maybe, maybe not, but we got a great show here, guys. We've got Rachel Greenwald, uh, who has an MBA from Harvard Business School, BA in psychology from Wellesley. She has spent her lifetime helping people find their match. She was the dating expert on NBC's reality TV dating show, The Match Off. She conducted interviews with a thousand single men asking them why they didn't call back after a date. She turned that into a project. She has helped over 750 people get married. We're not going to ask her about that. We're going to ask her, OG, about a Harvard Business Review piece that she wrote about, you know what, maybe these dating tips being better at first date might help you with interviews or with client meetings. When you first meet somebody, how do you come off as more likable? She's here. And then, of course, as uh, Doug, you said so brilliantly earlier, we got Demona Hoffman, who uh, Drew Barrymore shows dating coach joining us to talk about relationships, whether they're business relationships, friendships, trying to get your circle of influence people together. We are going to be all things relationship today. So how about that? Rachel Greenwald up next in our headline. And then uh, Demona Hoffman also upstairs. It's relationship day in the basement. So let's get started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. And I'm super happy she's here with us. Rachel Greenwald joins us. How are you? I'm great, Joe. It's so great to be here. Well, I've got the most pertinent question before we get to today's headline, Rachel, which is this. By the way, happy Valentine's Day to you. Before we get to this piece, reality television, I want to know... Because I don't get to meet a lot of people that have done any type of reality TV. Give me a little behind the scenes. Was love always in the air? Where like how do, how does this stuff get made? Well, I was on a couple reality shows briefly. They are definitely scripted behind the scenes. Oh, sorry to burst your bubble on that. Uh, but they really teach lessons along with the drama and shock value. So I actually learn a lot from them and it impacts my coaching in a lot of different ways. Is it fun or stressful or both? Being on the show is highly stressful. <laughs> uh, watching it is a lot of fun. I can, I can believe it. Well, our headline today focuses on a piece I read on a plane. I, I, I told you before we hit record, Rachel, I, I read this two years ago 
And then I totally missed it. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness she can join us. You wrote this piece for Harvard Business Review, a matchmaker's advice on how to make a great first impression at work. And you point out there are many similarities between the skills that you have to have to score a mate and also to score a new job. Can you start walking us through that connection? Right. Well, I am a professional matchmaker and dating coach. And so my research is really originated in the dating world. I did a 10-year dating research project where I interviewed over a thousand singles. And you will not be surprised to hear that people do not wait to get to know you before passing judgment. And so two of the most common reasons that I found about why you might not get a second date or equally you might not get hired for a job or you might not connect with potential clients or investors is that someone was nice but boring or someone asked interrogation style questions that produced facts but not an emotional connection. So I think that's a category that a lot of people don't realize how it's coming across. You know, they act like data collectors instead of conversation partners. Give me an example of that. Is that like just, so what do you do for fun? What's the, you know, what's your job? What's your, like they're checking off boxes? Right. I mean, the most common question most people ask first, at least in the United States, is what do you do? And so that, of course, is immediately collecting data and people are using what you do as a proxy for stereotyping you. So if you say, I'm an accountant, most people will immediately stereotype you as boring. But of course, accountants are not all boring and you can present that information in a very different way than just giving the the statement. So, you know, for example, you could turn it into an intriguing guessing game. You could say, I don't know, something like, uh, well, what do I do? Uh, I'll give you a couple of clues and see if you can guess. Ah. I had to get a master's degree for it. And it usually involves avocados, you know, so (laughs) all of a sudden, you're not just collecting information, you're making a connection with someone, you're being intriguing which is really important. You know, boredom is a very big dynamic in most conversations. People just go on autopilot and get really bored. And so leaning into the feeling that you are trying to create in a conversation instead of just the data that you're trying to extract is a really big part of making positive first impressions, both in love and at work. I want to go back to the first thing that you said there, which is people don't wait to get to know you before passing judgment, which I know a lot of our stackers, Rachel, I mean, that's, it's disappointing because I know, and, and uh, listen, you see it all the time with people dating, right? They're like, why I'm a nice person. Why aren't people giving me a shot? You say, and this was a big aha when I read your piece, we didn't even wait for that first meeting. Like people are pulling you up online. So your profile online becomes very important because that's really the first connection. Right. Uh, Pre-impressions are the new first impressions. What that means is that, you know, we typically think of first impressions as when we meet someone face to face, even if it's virtual face to face. But in fact, people have already formed an opinion of you before you get to face to face because they've Googled you. So there is a lot of um, confirmation bias that's going on, which is a psychological term that basically just means that people see what they expect to see, and then they ignore information that opposes those expectations later on. LinkedIn photos are really important. People don't think about that as a part of first impressions, but as soon as I am going to meet with somebody, I Google them and LinkedIn is usually the search result that I click on first. And so if you have a smile, for example, that, you know, you think is a confident smile, I might perceive it as a smirk or arrogance. And then going into the first meeting with you, I'm, I've got that confirmation bias. I'm looking to confirm that you're arrogant. So I really try to get people to think about, again, both in dating and at work and in life. I mean, adult friendships is a big category for this as well, to think about your online presence as really your first impression. That's the pre-impression that I'm talking about. 
you give some, you give some tips here. And I think then, then when you talk about that, you know, I think the smile is nice. You think it's a smirk. That must be why you say in this Harvard business review piece, don't choose your own photos. Yeah, it is super important that you have other people choose your social media profile photos because you are never a good judge of how you come across. So if you think, you know, a photo is friendly or confident or serious, you have no idea how someone else is perceiving this. There's actually a great website out there called photofeeler.com and you can upload your photo. You don't even have to ask people, you know, if you're uncomfortable with that, you can just upload your photo and type in three adjectives that you're trying to project with your photo. And then they have anonymous people vote on a scale of one to 10, much that photo accomplishes your goal. So for example, if you want to look warm, then you type that in and 10 or 20 anonymous people will vote on a scale of one to 10. I think that you look like a four out of 10 on warmth. So then you know to pick a different photo and you can keep running photos through the site. It's really cool. I like that even better than asking friends because friends might not want to hurt my feelings. You know what I mean? (laughs) Some friends might just want to tell me what I want to hear. Yeah. Well, that that's interesting too, because getting feedback about anything, and certainly this is true about photos, but it applies to anything in life that people don't want to give you candid feedback. And so what I suggest people do, again, this is on any metric, is to ask people using a multiple choice format. So for example, you wouldn't say about your photo, is this a good photo of me? You would say, I'm thinking about using this photo, but I'm wondering which of these four adjectives the photo uh, signals to you. You know, is it confident? Is it warm? Is it friendly? Or is it something else? And so forcing that multiple choice format allows people to not hurt your feelings because they're forced to answer one of the questions. One of the choices. I think we can also start not being boring with your LinkedIn profile as well. You say to insert one self-deprecating line in your LinkedIn bio. And I'd never even thought of that, Rachel. That's pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. It's funny because when you get past the photo and people start reading about your background, they want to connect with you on a human level. And so if you could, you know, insert a casually self-deprecating line you know, I think it's really great. Something along the lines of, uh, you know, I was voted most likely to win at a 7-Eleven Slurpee contest in high school, (laughs) you know, sort of like a humble brag, of course, with a, a joke. It's endearing. How do you though, overall, you know, you've got this problem. How do you get rid of being boring? How do you present yourself as not being boring? Well, The first thing you want to make sure you do is ask questions that are more interesting than your typical, how are you? How was your weekend? If you're meeting somebody for the first time, either on a date or, you know, in a job interview, you could ask somebody something like, uh, if you could be anywhere today besides interviewing me, where would you be? You know, instead of the standard, how you doing? There are important areas about not being boring that are priming someone for your upcoming meeting. So they enter the space with you in a good mood or in an intriguing mindset. So for example, I always tell people to insert a fun note into a calendar invite, you know, like bring your best joke, I've got prizes. So you're setting somebody up to want to talk to you expecting that this isn't going to just be your casual exchange. It's so funny that you bring this up today because literally in the last week, I was watching the CEO of Microsoft, Rachel, say the same thing about meetings, about, listen, you got to make these meetings more interesting. You get, you have to, as a leader, you like, you have to cut through with your people. So it's funny how much this, uh, this all intertwines in business. But a lot of this is a lot of this isn't just verbal. You point out that a lot of what we do, a lot of the interactions we have as people, when people, whether it's a mate or the next job, people are reading your body language. What do we need to remember body language wise? Uh, Well, body language is everything. You know, you have to pay attention to that. 
There are a lot of things. First of all, I think um, putting your phone out of sight when you're talking to somebody, not just on silent mode, not just turning off the volume or flipping it over on the table, but actually putting it away is a huge part of body language that signals you have my full attention. I think also that you want to stand belly button to belly button with somebody, which again, squares you in front of them and signals you have my full attention. I'm always a big fan of leaning forward towards someone when you're talking to them. I mean, not in a creepy way, like you're halfway into their face, but in a way that is just sort of leaning toward them, including on a virtual screen, by the way, not just in person, but like resting your chin on the heel of your hand. And Does that just if, show you're interested? I'm thinking leaning forward means I'm in this conversation. Right. I mean, think of the opposite, which would be somebody leaning back in their oh, chair. Yeah. It's, you know, that sort of feels like they're disconnected or they're judging you. So leaning forward is what exactly signals like I'm on the edge of my seat. I care about what you're saying. Like, tell me more about that. And then just one more thing about body language that comes to mind, which is something not to do. A lot of people don't realize this, but people who smile with their eyebrows raised, that can signal anxiety and suggest that you're overly eager to be liked. So I really encourage people to practice in the mirror and make sure they're not doing that. Wow, that's a hard one. Well, it's practice. You know, I think communicating and making a great first impression is a skill like learning a foreign language. It takes practice. You know, that's good news. It's empowering. It's something you can improve. It's not just, you know, this conclusion that you are or are not good at making first impressions. I think a lot of people get stuck in that mindset. What a great point, because a lot of people, as you know, Rachel, call these soft skills. And yet, it's for me, it's 90% of the reason why I don't buy is because of lack of soft skills, right? So practicing this stuff really makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is so important that you get feedback about how you're coming across. I mean, we talked about that in terms of photos, but also feedback in terms of your communication style, because you are the only one that doesn't know how you come across. And so you have to ask people and take it seriously. Like, you know, any other goal that you have, like losing weight or exercising or reading more books, like you have to structure it, name it, get input, put it into your calendar. And this is true for improving your dating skills and improving your first impressions and communications at work and in adult friendships. I will link to this piece on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com because, as I said, I read this two years ago and it's just stuck with me and I'm so happy you could talk about it. I've got one more question on a whole different topic, much more centered on Valentine's Day. But before we get to that, what's happening right now at Elevated Connections? What do you got going on, Rachel? Well, in my business, I am doing a lot of different things around Valentine's Day. It's a really big time of year. I just finished doing a retreat at Canyon Ranch Spa in Tucson for Oh, single... I bet that stunk. Just a <laughs> horrible scenery. Oh. oh, it's so beautiful there. <laughs> I would go there and just live if I could. But it's called Jumpstart New Love and Relationships. And it's, it's really great. It's my favorite thing I do all year, probably, honestly, because it's looking at love through a holistic lens about not just dating techniques, but also improving your health, your nutrition, your energy level, your spiritual connection to be in a space where you can create new and successful relationships. That's fabulous. And if people want to learn more, uh, yeah, they can just go to my website. All the events and services are on the website, rachelgreenwald.com. Yep. And we'll link to it that in our show notes. All right. My last question is not so much around business. It's just about all of our relationships. And on Valentine's Day, you focus a lot, obviously, on people with that first impression. But where do we get it wrong with some of these relationships around Valentine's Day that we've had for a long time, Rachel? Maybe where we can have more intimacy with the people around us? I think that Valentine's Day is a great opportunity to really ask yourself, how is love working for me and can I improve it? And so, you know, your audience 
is focused on financial content. And so I think for Valentine's Day, I would recommend, especially if you're in a couple, to read a book that John Gottman wrote a couple of years ago that I really love called Eight Dates. Um, it's Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. And he has a framework where he suggests that couples go on eight different dates, each with a separate theme. And there's a money date. And so, you know, as you probably know, money is one of the top reasons that couples fight. And so this money date is basically to take your partner and go out on a relaxed date on Valentine's Day. I mean, it's the perfect opportunity to do it where your goal is really to just understand what shapes your partner's attitude about spending or saving money so that the two of you can better navigate money conflicts when they come up. Most people know that conflicts about money are really not about dollars. They're about what the money means, like security or fun or freedom or trust, whatever. And so on this money date with your partner, you can ask questions like, did your parents feel comfortable spending money or was money discussed in your home when you were a child or what's your most painful memory about money? Did your family do any charity activities or donate to charities? All these kinds of questions that you may think you know about your partner, especially if you've been with them for a long time, but you may never have asked these specific questions that are listed in the chapter. And it's really powerful because if the money date is successful on Valentine's Day, you not only get to understand your partner's history with money better, but you can focus on what you have, not what you don't have. You can allow yourself to dream about money and really connect around a different type of celebration on Valentine's Day than I think most people really have come to expect on February 14th. Huge thanks to Rachel Greenwald for stopping by. A lot of good stuff there, OG. Making a good first impression. So, so important. And there's a lot of similarities there, right? Between getting people to like you, maybe like you like a friend or like you a little bit more than a friend. It's kind of sort of the same. It, It truly is. The rules of making yourself more attractive. It's hard when it looks like this. I understand it's already kind of right at the top end, but... There's always adjustments that can be made. Well, and I'm glad the Harvard Business Review picked up on it. And obviously then so did we. And so now all of our stackers. Small little magazine. Absolutely. Hey, time for our TikTok Minute. Very special Valentine's Day TikTok Minute. I'm not even going to ask you, OG, if this is good advice or not. Bad advice. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say, I wouldn't do this. I would not, I would not think this way. I would not do this stuff. However, this is some advice for Valentine's Day from comedian Lewis Black that you may want to ignore. And I think that this Valentine's Day, what we should do is instead of giving the gifts, that this might be a good time of year to take the money that you would normally use to buy a gift and send it to a, a charity that you think is important. I think it's a great way to do it. You're home free. First off, uh, for the men out there, you're lucky. You don't have to figure shit out. Do you? What does she want? What do I have to get her? What's going to shut her the f*** up? <laughs> and this way you go, they go, you go, what'd you get me? And you say, well, I, I left, uh, I gave $200, let's say, to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And then, and then what's she going to f- say? <laughs> you should have given me the money? What up? And then you go, you're a f- And you're off the hook. Just like that. You're off the hook. Off the hook. I don't... I don't think I'd do it that way. I don't think I would think that way. Well, you could do both. You could do the charity part. That part's okay. The gift and the charity. Yes, gift and, and charity, probably a better maybe, way to go. Maybe not, uh, maybe, maybe not have the repartee in the exact parlance of Lewis Black. Do you think you actually have to show the, the receipt of the gift to the charity? 100%. Or can you just say it's just you like the it. IRS. No, it is 100% like the IRS. Any cash contribution in lieu of gift gonna... must be properly disclosed and reported on form 709b everyone knows this your wife has a form 709b <laughs> why not just say i gave a thousand dollars then yeah. doug yeah hey, absolutely I gave... yeah. that's what i think i found a loophole i'll try it and report back i was gonna pay the house off however <laughs> you yeah. mean so much to we me. gave 300 grand <laughs> instead i love you so much 
Not a great, not a great way to look at Valentine's Day. XOXO. XO. But uh, Lewis Black uh, with some bad Valentine's Day advice. Coming up next, Demona Hoffman not only is the dating expert on the Drew Barrymore show. She also has been a dating expert on BET television. She's had a serious XM show. She has a fantastic podcast called Dates and Mates. Of course, she's been featured in Cosmopolitan, Huffington Post, Bustle, and uh, tops the charts in relationship category on most podcast platforms. But you know what? All that's irrelevant because she's here today with relationship advice for all of us to make our working relationships better, to make life at home better, stack Benjamin's quicker when you've got great relationships around you. But to get there, Doug, I think you've got some Valentine's Day trivia for us, man. Love that you just teed me up like that, Joe. I sure do. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And hey, you don't have to be with someone to enjoy Valentine's Day. In fact, 15% of women do this on Valentine's Day, which does not include anybody else. So my question is, what touching gesture is it? I'll be back right after I consider treating myself. It doesn't take that long. Hey there, stackers. I'm solo lover and boy who just wants to have fun by himself, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Traditionally, we think we have to celebrate love with someone else, but you can love yourself, you know. You don't need anybody else. 15% of women know this as they do this to themselves. I know, I know. This one's pretty obvious. You guessed it, right? I mean, it, it's ordering flowers for themselves. Like, wait, what did you guess? And now, to teach us more about love, we welcome Demona Hoffman. And here she is sitting down at our virtual card table in mom's basement. Demona Hoffman's here. Love is in the air, Demona. It sure is. And I'm so happy to finally be here in the basement with you. <laughs> it is about time. We go way back to a little room in Nashville where you and I hung out for, I think it was like an hour and a half waiting for Mark Cuban to show up. But it was a good time because there were, there were drinks. There was yes. good conversation. A lot of neat people. That was a small room, a small group of people, but all neat people like I met you there. I met other cool people. It was, it was a good time. It was And fabulous. we got to meet Mark Cuban. <laughs> I know. Well, I don't know if you remember. He came over at first and he go goes and grabs some food and he comes and, and he s comes right up to me and goes, hey, do you mind if I stand here next to you? Oh, really? Screw you, Mark. <laughs> like, screw No. No, do not stand next to me. Like, like are you who's kidding? Who's this guy? Yeah. <laughs> no one knows him. What does he know about finance? Eating food. Well, hey, we're not here to talk about that. Let's talk about this because, Demona, you know, many of us uh, love our jobs, but we don't love networking, that we know that networking works. It's exciting to hear you talk about the art of attractiveness and the fact that even not even a romantic setting, because even if we weren't all blessed with the world's best looks, I have a, I have a face for radio. You say there are some things we can all do, though, to be more attractive, which is going to help us, like, not just romantically, which is what you talk about all the time, but in every walk of life, just being a more attractive person to be around. I say that all of the skills that you build in your life in all the different areas, none of them are wasted. And as a dating and relationship coach, I actually help people pull from those skills to be more successful in dating and in relationships, I, I often say date like it's your job. But, you know, not everybody's good at their job. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I also look at dating and relationships as a set of learned skills. And, you know, we we read a lot of fairy tales as kids and we see a lot of rom-coms and we think it's supposed to just happen magically. But I have seen after doing this for 15 years that when you approach dating and relationships with that same kind of focus, you do other things in your life that you're successful at you get different results, more successful results. But I didn't start out as a dating coach. I actually started out in television casting. I would find there were a lot of talented actors that just didn't know what to do to get in the door with someone like me or someone like my boss. So I started teaching classes at night for actors and how to market themselves, how to have headshots that would stand out and tell their story, how to 
win over the room when they walked into an audition. And I was online dating at the time. And I started to see the similarities between what I would tell actors about their headshots and what I needed to do with my dating profile photos to get noticed by the kind of men that I wanted to meet and get in the kind of rooms I wanted to be in, which were dates, and make that great first impression. So I realized that those skills were applicable. I ended up meeting my husband online way back in 2000. Three people were online dating back then. Really? <laughs> yeah. And um, that was the time when I realized maybe there is something to this. I didn't really think of it as a strategy, but people would come to me after I met him and say, well, what were you doing? And I'd say, let me see your profile. And I'm like, oh, no, your picture's saying this. And why do you have a picture of a kid? And you're like, you're a single guy and you're looking to have kids, but you already got a kid and that's your cousin's kid. And like... <laughs> Dating profile bait. We could talk about that all day. That's like <laughs> thirst trap photos for women, like pictures oh, no. of you with kids. Oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, I realized that there really was a strategy that then I could repeat for other people. And I think we can do the same thing then with our LinkedIn uh, presence, right? I mean, if it's going to work on a dating app, we can do the same thing for LinkedIn. Whether we're submitting for casting to you, we're on a dating app, do my LinkedIn. What am I getting wrong usually, Demona? First of all, I'm going to give you a hot tip, by the way, about LinkedIn. <laughs> you didn't ask for this one. For those who are online dating, safety is really important. And a lot of people don't realize that LinkedIn is the best Google sleuthing. It's the best internet sleuthing tool oh. to catch a catfish. So oh. that's, my, that's my hot tip for the day for those who are online dating. But for those who are using LinkedIn, it, it, well, first of all, it's, it's important to get clear on what you're using it for. And I say the same when people are dating. I put them where the pool of people that they want to meet is. So are you using LinkedIn for networking? Are you using LinkedIn for business relationships and more long-term laying the foundation and networking? Are you using it to promote your business? There's there's so many different ways. Are you job seeking? You know, so we start from there. We start from the the end goal, and this is the same way I start my my clients. I say, what is your relationship goal, and then we work back from there. It's important in all of these situations to lead with relationship building first. So a lot of times on LinkedIn, I'll get cold pitches. You know, I, I'm on the Drew Barrymore show. I do dating and relationship segments on the Drew Barrymore show. People will out of the gate on LinkedIn be like, can I get um, my perfume in to Drew's hands because oh I want God. her flower beauty oh brand to God. promote it oh. or to produce it. And it's like, first of all, that's, I don't know you. Second of all, that's not even what I do, <laughs> you know? So we we have to really be strategic in all these places that we show up, you know, whether it's LinkedIn or even Instagram, TikTok, all of these places that people are going to then search for you. Like if, if you meet online and you meet someone online, they're going to go look for you on Instagram. And if they see a post that's meant for something else out of context – that is all going to now factor into their impression of you. So we have to consider our identity and our online identity are now linked in a way that they've never been before. And we have to be really conscious about the way that we present ourselves in all of those facets. This is fabulous, Demona, because it reminds me of, you might know, Dr. Thomas Stanley wrote this book called The Millionaire Next Door which was about how the richest people, you know, generally drive a Buick and you don't have any clue that they're, that they got lots <laughs> oh, of money. I drive a Buick, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why we have you on. Cause we know that Demona's got the big bucks. That's exactly why <laughs> first clue, but he actually, most people, that book was a big time bestseller. A lot mm -hmm. of people get, got a highs from it. Most, a lot of our fans here probably have, have read it or heard of it. What they haven't heard of. He also sold books to Mona for financial advisors saying if you want to market to or network with affluent people, guess what you do? Stop going to the money shows. Like every town has these money shows. They get like the boat show and the home show. They have a money show. All your competition is at the money show. Why the hell would you go to the money show? No, go to a place. If you want to work with physicians, go to the physicians conference. If you want to work with engineers, go to the engineering conference. And so I started doing those as a financial planner. I was the only 
booth. Like when I went to the engineering conventions, I was the only booth that was on financial planning. Every single one was, you know, building trades, was using this CAD program, was using this thing, like all these things, one financial planner, 500 engineers, who is the people I want to work with in one room together. You're saying really the same thing. Yeah, you're, you're totally right with that. And that's actually one of my offline dating strategies. I'll tell people, go where the pool is and where you are not going to have as much competition. So don't go to the speed dating things. Well, I say do it all, though. That was going to be the second part of it. Okay. But yeah, you will probably have more luck. Like, There's actually something that's been trending this week that I was going to talk about on TikTok, where women are saying, go to Home Depot to meet a man. (laughs) Right. There's like no other ladies there. And they say, go, but go on a Friday night because on a Saturday afternoon, all the married men are there. You got to go on a Friday night. You get the single guys. (laughs) This is what I do with people. I, I originally, when I, when I started coaching, I called myself a dating strategist and I know it sounds unromantic, but I know that it works when we get strategic about, okay, who do you want to meet? Then we, we figure out, do you, you, you make it a mix. You make a, a balanced portfolio here of opportunities to meet someone. So you may go to the Home Depot or if you're a guy, I don't know, I say go to the yoga class or something like that. Then you also do have to play in the bigger pool too. So a lot of people will come to me saying that they don't like online dating. They they reject dating apps. But I'm like, that's where 40% of couples begin today. Are you going to just not go to the party? And you can just go to Home Depot every Friday night, and that's fine. Or you can be in the pool where everybody else is, and they're looking for the same thing. But that's where we have to get strategic about the way you're presenting yourself. And that's where using all of those marketing skills that I used to teach actors come into play when I'm coaching uh, singles. Okay, I wasn't going to go here next, but I'm wondering if I'm single at Home Depot... And I'm scoping out single people, right? And this is great in any type of networking. How do you go up to somebody you don't even know at Home Depot and start a discussion to even find out if there might be something here? Two easy ways are to, I I say you want to either have a compliment or a question at the ready. So that's a very easy way to break the ice, just a a compliment to someone on something that they're wearing. And I actually tell people to wear, I call it conversation piece clothing, something that has a story behind it that you could tell. So So that's a very- Wear my my Speedo to Home Depot. Is that what you're saying? You definitely would get a lot (laughs) of comments and compliments, I'm sure. Uh, (laughs) I mean, there's something also in like the pickup artist community. They call it peacocking, but where you wear something very – now, I don't have people go that far, but just something that that could be a conversation starter. And then also use the environment around you. Like you could ask a question. The easy I – have, I have been a woman, a single woman in Home Depot before, and I don't know anything about construction. And so that's like the perfect – the perfect environment for me to just go up to someone and say, do you know how this works? And I know guys love being helpful. They love teaching a lady a thing or two. So it's just a very easy opening. And you can use a question about anything in the environment. I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves to like, I have to be witty. I have to come up with with something that's going to inspire this kind of response. And usually... Usually the first thing that comes to mind is the best thing to lead with. And when you think about it too much, you're pre-plan it too much, too much, it feels inorganic. This is why I also have my clients, as they go through the process with me, getting clarity on what they're looking for is just the beginning. Having a strategy is the next thing. And then we, we do skill building. I do improv. I do dating improv with my clients to prepare them for those situations so that they're not second guessing themselves and they can kind of release that filter and just really be in the moment and be authentic with someone. Man, improv is perfect for dating. I'm going because I've, I've taken a few improv classes. I never thought about that use case, but I did think about it for networking. So whether no matter what type of networking is, improv is wonderful. Yeah. And it teaches you to listen. That's the most important thing in building relationships and having a conversation. Good listening skills and staying in the moment. Because, you know, you go to a party and you're like, 
hi, my name's Demona. Hi, I'm I'm Joe. And then like you get in the conversation and 30 seconds later, you're like, what the what? hell's her name? What was her name? <laughs> What's her name? <laughs> it's because we are projecting to the future already and we're already thinking we're in our heads about what are we going to say and how am I going to connect with this person and like, do I have something in my teeth and <laughs> do they think I'm weird? It is really a practice of getting yourself in a space of being able to be present and really listen. How much of attractiveness is verbal and how much of it is nonverbal cues? Ooh, this is tricky because I think we're in a time where our brains are changing because so much of our communication is digital now. I've had to develop a whole curriculum around that because originally we've developed communication based on a number of cues, the visual, body language, vocal inflection, tone, vocabulary, so many things that factor into our impression of somebody. Now, so many people are connecting first. You know, you start off with LinkedIn and with a lot of my clients, it's with dating apps. I feel like our brains are sort of changing around this right now. At this point, if you're meeting someone face to face, it does all factor in all of those things that I mentioned and more. And this is why I find I have to get people out of their heads because when we start thinking, about, oh, maybe I'm not attractive enough to be talking to this person they don't like me. We change the way that we present ourselves and the way that we start interacting and usually not for the better. <laughs> I absolutely believe that. And I'm, I'm thinking about people that I've met when I first see them and, you know, we all make an immediate judgment call. I'm like, oh, they're not very attractive, but then I find them attractive, Demona, because they're confident mm -hmm. because when they walk up to me and they talk to me, I'm like, wow, I really find myself liking this person that from across the room, I didn't think was, you know, was anybody that I'd ever talked to. Is there some technique, some strategy that I can do that, that will help me kind of get there? Like, you know, square my shoulders, look you in the eye. Like I had this one guy a long time ago and, and I do this now by habit. I look at you in the eye while you're talking and I nod and I make sure that I'm in that conversation, no matter how bad I'm an introvert at heart, no matter how bad my brain wants to get out of there. And there have been times, by the way, this is horrible to admit, where I've been zoning out, but the person I'm talking to thinks I'm completely in it because they're like, you are one of the best listeners I've ever met. And I'm like, oh my God, what the hell were we talking about? <laughs> like it's just become a habit. But are there techniques like that, that we can use that project confidence, that project this um, eagerness to be more in this uh, conversation? <laughs> I, I'm still surprised to hear you say that you're an introvert because I did not have that impression of you at Nobody all. Nobody has we, that impression. Right? I need to sleep for an hour once we're done talking. <laughs> I feel like I should be turning the question around on you. <laughs> you know, like, how did you pull the wool over my eyes, Joe? No, but um, okay, a couple of hacks I'll give to help you, first of all, remember people's names and connect with them. Use their name in the conversation. So that solidifies, first of all, their name, and you're more likely to remember it if you're in conversation with them and repeating their name back to them in a very natural and organic way, Joe. <laughs> and then it, it also makes them really feel seen and heard, that it feels like you're not just talking to random people, you are really connecting with them specifically, personally. The other thing is that people find you more interesting when they are talking about themselves. So people wow. feel like wow. you're right. <laughs> they have positive feelings because they like talking about positive experiences that they've had and feeling like they're being listened to and they're very impressive. And they will associate those positive feelings with you, whether or not they have actually shared anything positive themselves. That is another hack <laughs> to really ask good questions. And I say to my clients, ask questions that get people to tell a story and also ask questions that tap into nostalgia because nostalgia is immediately bonding. So if I said to you, Joe, what did you do for summers growing up as a kid? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We do bond over that, don't we? Yeah, I was. that was a question. But... <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but like, even if they're different, <laughs> I think about, okay, then where does that lead us? It leads us to either we have similarities or we have differences. And either way, it's such a nostalgic, low stress area that we can talk about our differences growing up. And it becomes a nice bonding experience is there that we're here together today where we're alike, even though we had these cool differences that we can celebrate. Yes, exactly. And it evokes those memories in me, even if I did something completely different than you did as a kid over the summer. I'm now thinking about summer and, you know, the watermelon hunt and the pig roast. Sorry for the vegetarians. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I loved the pig roast. (laughs) Us too. Well, we did one in our backyard. We lived out in the middle of the country and somebody would actually, we would have the pig, the big pig smoker. Would you do this? Yeah. We had the big yeah. pig smoker. In fact, my high school graduation, Demona, at our house, a couple hundred people there roasted a roasted a pig and cut that thing up and yum. See, and I, I'm connecting with that. And I'm remembering growing up in Michigan and the 4th of July. So it's a different time, but this is actually... In a way, this is what we do when I do improv training. Okay, hold on. Where where were you in Michigan? <laughs> I grew up in East Lansing, oh home of God. the Spartans. Well, yeah, I'm a Spartan, and I grew see, up in Kalamazoo. We never knew. And do you see how then that that one entry point led to connections? And it's amazing. I, this is what I do all the time with my clients, and it's amazing seeing how many connections you can find where. When we started out the conversation, we may have thought we don't have that much in common. You're in Texar- Texarkana. Canna. <laughs> I'm in Los Angeles. But, you know, when we start going back, there's, there's so Never much heard of it. to build on. Never heard of it. Lost what? <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a little, little town. Um, it's going to fall in the ocean a few years from now. Yeah, anyway. I didn't want to hijack where you were going. I just heard <laughs> Michigan growing up. I'm like, what the hell? No, you, I mean, you made my point for me. And this is the thing that's so fascinating is that when we do start opening up, we're all so connected, not to sound like airy fairy, but we really are. And you can find a connection point with any person if you come from that, that intention and also from listening. And the last thing I'll add just about networking that I have my clients do whether they're business networking or dating networking, I have them give themselves a challenge before they even enter the room because it's human nature that we want to stay where we are comfortable, safe, and that is usually not talking to somebody that we don't know. So we have to give ourselves the additional incentive of, and it doesn't have to be like, I'm going to close this deal, just I'm going to tell that story. I'm going to tell them my story about my graduation party, or I'm going to talk to three people that I don't know, or I'm going to follow someone I don't know on Instagram. And giving that challenge primes you to take actions that you wouldn't otherwise take. I want to ask one last question, because as I went around the country last year talking to our stacker community, there was one question people asked me over and over and over. And having a pro at this with me, I'd be remiss, you know, this being tomorrow being the big relationship day in the United States. Um, oh, I hadn't there, noticed. What is yeah, it? <laughs> what, what day? <laughs> Has nothing to do with me. What's going on there? In every family, you've got one, one person who's really into the money discussion, another person who's not in the money discussion. Sometimes it's, you know, one of my other things I love is board games. You know, people even write me, they're like, how do I get my spouse to like board games as much as I do? And I find that, you know, when you drag your spouse, your loved one, your partner, whoever it is to the table, they hate you even more. They're like, no, I don't want to be dragged to this crap, right? So how do we get this person involved and make it a we thing instead of a me thing, whether it's managing your money together or, you know, taking walks or, you know, spending time on each other's activities? Is there a way that you push through that conflict? Well... Even looking at it as a conflict, I wonder what would happen if, here, I'll I'll just give you the bottom line. Couples actually only need to have one or two core interests in common to be successful. There are far more important things than having shared interests. I have my clients focus on shared values, common goals for the future, and building trust and communication. And everything else is sort of just a nice to have. 
I find that we put too much emphasis on our partner being able to complement us in all areas of our life. So there's a difference between saying, honey, I'd love for you to just play a board game with me once a week, once a month, and I need to get my partner into board games. My husband is a crossword puzzler, like hardcore crossword puzzler, like every day, New York Times, every day. That is my greatest torture. (laughs) I have no interest whatsoever. If he said to me, I need us to do these crossword puzzles together to stay together, I'd be like, well, it's been a long and lovely run. But if you can find at least one or two shared interests and then really look at your partner, not as the be all and end all, but as someone who's one relationship and you find other people to complement your life and build other relationships. We put too much emphasis on this one relationship. There are other people, Joe, who will play board games with you. I'll play board games, <laughs> but, but don't bring but, me a crossword puzzle. But I think, well, don't bring me a crossword puzzle either. And I'll play board <laughs> games with you anytime, Demona. But if it's a core activity, I feel like, you know, money management is, I always, when I was a financial planner, if one person managed all the money and then they passed away, the spouse, the loved one, whoever's left is, you know, they're meeting me for the first time going, I have no idea where any of this is, which is why I really need them in the room. And I tried to focus on making it fun and involving them. And, but I'm wondering if there's a way to get them into that core activity. It totally depends on the person there. I mean, we're talking about interests and fun activities versus core activities to live a successful and functional life. So that's the kind of thing where it's like, you have to come to the table, but you know, having had many a meeting with, with my, well, what do do they call wealth management advisor? Wow. Hey, is that what you call it? I drive a Buick, Joe. I don't know if you heard. Of course (laughs) you must be super wealthy then. Must be. Yes. Wealth management advisor, (laughs) advisor, financial planner, whatever it might be. Yeah, I hate those meetings with my husband and him. Like, my interests lie in different areas. But I come to the table, and we can focus on the parts of that that interest me and divvy up so that the parts that interest him, that can be a different part of the conversation. And we're all at least functional at the table together. Love that. Because then then you know where everything is, but I don't have to be an expert at it all, which I think is... Really the point. You can't be an That's expert at everything. That's the key. We, yeah. we don't have to be an expert in in everything. We just have to support our partner's goals. So I'm never going to like insult him or demean him because he likes crossword puzzles, even though I think it's like a huge waste of time. <laughs> that <laughs> – wait, did I just do that? <laughs> yeah. Inside no. voice, Demona. Inside voice. I know. I'm never going to do that. I'm going to support him and his goal to do crossword puzzles. But you know what? He found that his best friend who lives in another city does the crossword puzzles every day. They get to talk and have their little man time about it every every week. So I don't need to be in that. But he knows that I am supporting him and his goals. And I can go off and do yoga and do all the weird things that I do. And he doesn't have to have any part of that either. Well, and and it's funny because I think that comes back to we put too much pressure on ourselves and all this stuff. I love how you lower the pressure, make these things easy. We don't want to go into conversations knowing everything. We just let it breathe. Love the tips today. So two questions, Demona. What's coming up on the podcast that nobody else knows about? You know, nobody listens to Stacking Benjamins. It's just you and me. What's a (laughs) secret thing that you can tell me that, you know, just for us, that's coming up? You're you're making the assumption I plan this far ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then it's going to be something special. Honestly, I've been doing the show for 10 years. We have a pretty tight format. We do headlines of dating relationship headlines ripped from the headlines news. We do an interview and we do a Dear Demona Q&A. And I'm thinking of switching up the format a little bit and oh, giving, yeah. Well, there's something. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. And then I also, I just turned in my manuscript for my new book wow. that comes out next January. So you'll also be seeing little excerpts and tidbits from the book over the next year. And it year. means hopefully we also get Demona back here this time next year. You better. Hopefully we do. The podcast is Dates and Mates. And then second, if people just want to work with you, uh, how do they get a hold of you? 
Go to DemonaHoffman.com or DatesAndMates.com. I actually have lots of free goodies. I have a free profile starter kit. If you don't know how to write a profile or you need a refresh, I have lots of tools and tips and tricks up my sleeve that I'm happy to share there. And we'll have links to everything to moan on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Happy Valentine's Day, girlfriend. Love you. Love you too. Happy Valentine's Day. Hi, I'm David Hirsch. And when I'm not hosting the Dad to Dad podcast for the Special Fathers Network, which is a Dad to Dad mentoring program for fathers raising kids with special needs, I'm stacking Benjamins. Wow. Both of our experts, OG, bringing it today. Rachel and Demona. Big thanks to Demona Hoffman for stopping by. Good stuff. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, OG. Obviously, chocolates and flowers. I thought you were going to say gifts to cystic fibrosis. (laughs) (laughs) Fictitious uh, (laughs) charitable gifts. (laughs) Probably, Probably not. Probably not. It's your loved ones in your time. And they're always happier to see you when you bring chocolates and flowers. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackingbenjamins.com slash Haven Life now for a free quote. At Haven Life, I love what they're doing because they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. No waiting several weeks for a decision. Lovely customer support. And of course, policies issued by the parent company Mass Mutual more than 160 years old. So you know they've been there before. Stackingbenjamins.com slash Haven Life. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our new Valentine's crush, Chad. Say hi, Chad. Hey, Joe, OG, and Doug. This is Chad from Missouri. Question about Roth IRA contributions for 2023. I've been using VTSAX. I know it's a minimum of $3,000 contribution each time. I didn't know if I'd be able to do... 3,250 twice, or if I had to figure out something else different with that extra $500. Thank you so much. Chad, great to hear your voice again. And uh, man, it feels like forever ago that we actually, we actually met Chad guys. Remember in Kansas city, great to hear your voice. Long, long time ago. Yep, definitely. So OG, he's got two different accounts. How does he get his money all in this one account or does he need a second one? I think what he's talking about are the purchase price amounts for the mutual fund. Like the minimum purchase is 3000 This is 100% solvable by just using an ETF. There's no minimums for ETFs. You can do the same fund and you know whatever uh, asset class you want and not have to worry about the purchase minimum. And most of the time, the purchase minimum applies to the first purchase, not subsequent purchases also. Although every company is going to be a little different on how they deal with that. But if you have, if there is a minimum, you can just use the ETF and, you know, you can buy $5 worth of it without any transaction costs and get the money invested whenever you want. It's actually even a little less expensive than the mutual fund to do it that way. So no downside. Yeah. Yeah. Super easy. Trade it throughout the day. So you don't, you know, you know what you're buying, you know, at the, at the price that you're buying it for. But more importantly, you know, you kind of avoid that like minimum purchase amount where you end up with a whole bunch of money sitting in cash you know, waiting to accumulate enough money in order to, uh, to make that next purchase. So yeah, just use the ETF. Chad, you said the name of the fund that you wanted to buy was the Vanguard total stock market index. That's VTSAX. The, uh, equivalent of it, the ETF equivalent is VTI. So just buy VTI and you bought the same thing, but in ETF form. Thanks for that question, Chad. Bada boom, bada bang. Yeah, great hearing from you, man. And uh, hope you're doing well. Hey, if you want to be brave and ask a question like Chad did, we're sending Chad a stacker t-shirt, the greatest money show on earth, uh, wait, wait, Circus T. I'm pretty sure Chad got a t-shirt in Kansas City. If I remember right, he, he, he bought one of those shirts in Kansas City. He doesn't need a shirt. That was years ago, man. I mean, think about if he wears it every day, like I'm sure he does. Because he loves us so much. That shirt, he probably needs a new one. Probably about time. So, uh, stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. And uh, we will also answer your question and send you a shirt as well. It's about time for us to say goodbye. But before we go, some things on the community calendar. We've got an exciting week this week. You know, last week on Instagram Live, we talked to Maury Teherapur who is a negotiations expert and uh, professor at Wharton about how to earn more money, how to negotiate better. She comes at it from a completely different way. You can still find that over on our Instagram page, 
just follow Stacking Benjamins podcast over there. But this week, this week we will be live on Wednesday. I'm still finalizing the guest. So on Wednesday show, we will tell you, I think we had a, we had a little programming change, but I'm really excited about somebody that at the last minute, I think we're able to get, uh, but Wednesday, 5 PM Eastern, 2 PM Pacific is when we'll be live with our Instagram live coming up, by the way, we're going to be live on fireside with some great stuff for the show. Uh, OG, we're going to do last minute tax tips with Bob Wheeler, Bob Wheeler, who not only has a fantastic podcast of his own. He's also the CFO of the comedy store, maybe the number one comedy club in the nation, but has a tax practice and helps people with their taxes. So he's going to come on and nice guys, you got your tax questions. You can join us live on fireside. We'll record an interview for the podcast, but you can also get your questions answered as well. That's coming up to get more about that. Either join our basement Facebook group, just go to Facebook and put in stacking Benjamin's basement or uh, get the 201 newsletter, stackingbenjamins.com slash 201, which of course will come out tomorrow with next level tips on all the things that Demona and Rachel talked about today. But if, if you're not here for relationship advice, you're not here for last minute tax tips, you're concerned about the market and all the chatter about market uncertainty. OG and his team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market, that guy will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. Get this helpful free guide from OG. That's stackingbenjamins.com slash guide. That is our community calendar. Time for us to put a pin in it. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Doug, give our stackers the love letter. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Demona Hoffman and Rachel Greenwald. First impressions matter. Make a great entrance and not only will your love life improve, but life at work will improve as well. Second, take some advice from our TikTok Minute. On second thought, yeah, don't take advice from our TikTok Minute. That's a great trip. But the big lesson, man, why am I working so hard to send Joe's mom flowers on Valentine's Day? When, like, it seems so much easier for her to just do it herself. I mean, she knows exactly how she likes it, right? I mean, I'd just be like fumbling around. I'm all thumbs, right? I don't, she's better at the beat, whatever. Thanks to Demona Hoffman for joining us today. You can hear her weekly podcast, Dates and Mates, where you're listening to us right now. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. You can hire Paulette as your very own writing coach. With her program, Your Personal Editor, you get 10 sessions one-on-one with Paulette to add power to your words. More information at yourpersonaleditor.com. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the After Show. It's part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens here stays here. If you're new to the Stacking Benjamin Show, we don't talk about this. Every once in a while, somebody has to, you know, somebody just has to comment. And if you do, we made a concession a few years ago. Still not really happy with it. But uh, if you've got to talk about it, just mention dessert. This will be one of those, if you know, you know things. But on the topic of love, guys, love, comma, guys, <laughs> <laughs> just to, just to clarify, not that there's there's nothing wrong with love guys. I'm just that saying in this case new, that could be a new case. brand, new brand, not stacking <laughs> Benjamins, the love guys. Yeah, in this case, it is love comma guys, oh. but definitely could be. I got to tell you that um, just why why are British people so funny? Like I thought about this the other day. How often do we reference? British humor from the office, like the original office, which I think a lot of people still have not seen, which is hilarious. So painful to watch. So painful. Really difficult. I think it's because they can say the most vile, cutting, sharp things. And that accent just spreads velvet over everything. It's so good. And it's that dichotomy behind just how nasty the humor can be. But it just sounds like you're getting a, you know, a preaching from your minister at church sometimes. It is. It is so good. And I thought of this, especially when I heard this clip, just because I don't even know how these people think about this. Like, how do they, how do they dream this stuff up? This is uh this is a, a, a British clip from, I believe this is a uh, hospital radio. Let's, let's listen. There's a, there's a man. Well, who's going on the radio. Ivan Breckenbury. Out and about, reaching out and touching patients. Okay, we've got a request here for Phil, who's having his ears pinned back today. Good luck, Phil. This is Simply Red. Holding back the ears. <laughs> I just can't. There's just so much intelligence to their humor, too. That was so clever. <laughs> just so- there's a woman, and the- you don't need to see the video, but there's a woman sitting next to him, and she just looks over like, bravo. Like that is just you win. Hold, hold him back the ears. It's so, just it's it's a dad joke. It's cutting. It's all the things you said, Doug. You know what I mean? It's like all all levels. They hit it. Yeah, good stuff, guys. Anything you watching? OG, anything you are watching on TV? I just saw um, Nate Ber- Bergazzi Bergat- Ber- oh. has a new bit on uh, Amazon Prime. If you haven't yeah. seen it, it's uh, it's pretty. Funny. Have you watched it? Yeah, I watched it last night. Yeah, good. Yeah, it was, you know, eight out of 10. There's a really funny bit. He's talking about parents and being the firstborn. I don't know. Doug, you're not the firstborn. Joe, are you the firstborn? I'm yes. the lastborn. Yes. Yeah. So you'll get it because because it will resonate a lot with you being the, the last one. Joe, you'll get the whole firstborn, lastborn thing. But there's a really funny bit in the middle where he's like, he's talking about a sister. He's like, yeah, well, apparently she was raised by her best friends. You know, I couldn't say the word sucks. Because, you know, I get my mouth washed out, but my sister's like, I'm 18, I'm getting a tattoo. And so he goes this whole thing about, and he's like, and then my mom gets a tattoo. Like, what the heck? Like, like, but now, now they've, they're in this tatted gang, you know? (laughs) And so he does this whole bit. It's really funny. And then he goes to transition to like the next thing. He goes, oh, actually, there's another one in the middle. His name's Derek. Like he does this whole bit about his like. He's the oldest, and he's got a daughter, a sister who's the youngest. And then he goes, "Yeah, yeah, Derek. I think it's Derek. Anyways, Derek. He's like he kind of sneaks up on you. You're like, whoa, oh yeah, that's right. You're here. So talk about a guy anyway. with well written jokes like that. British humor, yeah, just all hits. PG stuff. So totally, yeah, he, totally clean. He's uh, all delivery. I mean, and the and the people that are that funny without going a little bit blue without using the language. They are masters of delivery. Yeah. Yeah. I think his, I think his best bit was the, the whole like airplane, Nate Nathaniel thing. Like, and it's for one of his first specials where, where he was like, you know, the guy's like, I don't think it's going to work. He's like, I think it will. (laughs) He can't get, get, uh, for people that don't know what OG's talking about, he can't get through TSA because the guy, it says Nate, on his ticket. Well, it's, not t- and his- yes, it, it's the baggage guy. The baggage, the baggage guy's like, guy. uh, right. these, these names don't match. He's like, I think we're going to make it. 
It was, it says Nate. My ticket says Nathaniel. You can see, you can see the stretch we made to get there. there. Yeah. yeah. You know what I particularly love that they did when they put the picture with the name. I think that does a pretty yeah. good job. <laughs> that really, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doug, you watch anything? Uh, yeah. We, you know, we jumped on the Last of Us train mm. and uh, way into that. You know that I don't like sci-fi. I generally don't like horror unless either one of those two genres are doing really well or were done very well. And there are a few exceptions to both of those genres of movies I do like. This is one of those. I uh, I have been really pleasantly surprised with how well constructed these stories are in the first. I think I'm through four episodes. What's interesting about that is it's a video game adaptation and it's hard right. to believe. Usually when you hear video game uh, redone, you're like, I'll pass. Like, this is going to suck. Yeah. No, it's really, really good. Even if you don't like zombie stuff. I would say give it a try because it's it's really well constructed. I did also see an article, Joe, you might, I don't know if I sent it to you or not, but I thought somebody made a pretty good point by saying Last of Us may have killed video games for like the next five plus years. Because now that Sony sees that they can monetize the heck out of very unidirectional, inline, story-driven Game, that's what we're going to get fed. That's what we're going to get. Every Everybody else is like, oh, crap, we want to be able to make that leap as well. And we can't do that if we have these giant open world games that let you do whatever you want to do. So let's try to recreate The Last of Us, you know, in a different genre or something. And so that's all we're going to see as like gamers. Call of Duty. It's going to be called, it's going to be Halo. Yeah. There is a Halo series. There is a Halo and apparently it sucks. Oh, that's right. There is. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that's what we're watching, guys. Happy Valentine's Day, gents. Hugs and kisses.